Hey besties, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, go ahead and click that subscribe button, click that bell, you just gained a new best friend. If you would like to find out how I went from an enlisted interior communications electrician to a medical officer as a medical student at USUHS, stick around. Let's get into it. Hey besties, I know this is long overdue, but to be frank with you, I have been so busy in medical school. But this video here is to answer any questions to those of you who have reached out to my Instagram or reached out via email inquiring about exactly how did I get to where I'm currently at. So if you want to know my why and some of my backstory before I joined the Navy, please check out the Navy's medicine interview with Dive In with the SG and I go into more detail in reference to that. But with this video, I'm going to start with boot camp. So if you want to know what happened before boot camp, I encourage you to check out that interview with the Surgeon General. If you're ready, let's get into it. So I embarked on my journey November 2010. I left for Great Lakes and went to boot camp. I know I'm showing my age. I am about to hit 12 years in the Navy, but I wouldn't change it for the world. So I did my time in boot camp. I ended up graduating boot camp January 14th of 2011. I then transitioned to the other side where they have A school and C school. And for those individuals who are not currently in the military, I will explain what A school and C school is. That's basically a school where you will go and learn how to do your job. So in the Navy, our jobs are called rates. So when you first enlist, you are given a rate based on your ASVAB and you get a choice um, based on what you score and how high you scored in the different subjects. You'll have a list of jobs that will coordinate with those scores. So I had quite a few jobs that were open to me. When I did take the ASVAB, I ended up getting a 93. Now based on your score and then the individual scores per subject, you'll have a list computed to let you know what you qualify for as far as a job. There are other aspects that go into that, such as medical, but for the most part, I qualified for almost every job that was out there. Um, unfortunately, what I wanted to do was to be a corpsman, and corpsman was currently overmanned at the time when I joined. So I signed up for interior communications electrician, not really understanding what I was getting myself into. My recruiter put it to me as, you're gonna be the people behind the Verizon guy. I don't know if you guys remember that commercial and I may be dating myself, but the guy who used to say, can you hear me now? Good. So he basically said that I would be the person in the back. That was like what my job was very frivolous definition of what my job was, but I went with it. So I went to boot camp in November 2010. Boot camp is eight weeks. I went during the winter. I am a summer baby. I was born in Hawaii, raised in Las Vegas. So this winter came to me as a shock. I was freezing. I was just shivering. I This was the first time I really seen snow and um, boot camp, it was fun. It was definitely fun. I met some great people. Um, I have some individuals I'm still friends with. So the weather definitely was probably the worst part for me. For overall, boot camp was great. I definitely gained lifelong friends from the experience. And it really teaches you how to work as a team. Um, there's a lot of team building in boot camp. Um, they have the motto in the Navy, one team, one fight. And that's something that they really emphasize at boot camp. So there's going to be various activities that you'll do as a group. Um, you'll be under a structured schedule, but overall boot camp is not as bad as people think it is. They're not going there to brainwash you. So whatever rumors you've heard, please talk to someone who's actually went to boot camp and they'll let you know. I mean, you work out, you attend school, you eat, um, you learn some of the history and courtesies of the Navy, but overall this experience was great. So after boot camp, I did go to A school, which was still in Great Lakes. Now, for those of you who are not in the military, A school is just a tech school that teaches us how to do our job. And then sometimes you'll get a C school, which 
focuses on a specific specialty within that job. So I did go to A school and C school um, in Great Lakes. My C school was called ILARTS, which is the Integrated Launch and Recovery Television System program where they teach us how to operate this system that essentially records the launch and recovery of aircraft on a carrier. So once I finished C school, I was stationed on the USS Theodore Roosevelt December 2012. So I was super motivated, super excited to get onto the show. I met some incredible mentors, which I still communicate to this day. Um, they have molded me to the person I am today and I would not be here without their time they took to mentor me, the time they took to advise me on what I should do in my next step, the times they've challenged me to want more and do more. So I'm very grateful for my mentors. And I definitely encourage you, if you are new to the Navy or thinking about the Navy, please surround yourself with individuals who are going to push you and challenge you and ask you, okay, you finished that, what's next? So I came to the ship as a E3. Um, so I was eligible to take the E4 exam within a few months of being on a ship. So I did take the March exam after reporting to the ship in December. Um, and fortunately, I did end up uh, making rank, which making rank means that you're advancing to the next pay grade. So I advanced to an E4, which in the Navy is considered a petty officer, um, third class. And so at this point, we are now in the summer of 2012. I am a third class petty officer and I have achieved both of my pins, an air warfare pin and a surface warfare pin. And in order to get those pins, there's a list of things that you have to complete, a list of departments you have to speak with, you have to take a test and then you have to take an oral board to make sure that you're competent in the information that is required of you. So with the third class under me now, two pins, I'm fully qualified to my pay grade, which means that I've completed all of the requirements as a third class to be eligible to become an E5. So there are certain, um, there are certain qualifications that you have to get in between ranks to be qualified to in order to advance to the next rank. So I have completed all this stuff at this point and I'm looking for more opportunities. So myself and a few others that were currently on the Roosevelt started the Junior Enlisted Association. And that gave us an opportunity to reach back out to the junior sailors because at the time they had a second class association, a first class association, but they didn't have anything specific for the junior sailors. So we created this program where we can assist the junior sailors, you know, provide volunteer opportunities and provide that camaraderie that comes with just being in the same rank and understanding some of the same things that you have to go through. So after the creation of JEA, I ended up being elected as the president and this was a great opportunity for me to reach back in the community. I'm huge, huge, huge on altruism. So um, we would do toy drives, we would do soup kitchens, we would go read to the, um, we would go read to the elderly, we would feed the homeless. Um, and then we also partnered with uh, PEEPS, with, which was um, a preschool for exceptional um, children with disabilities. And that partnership lasted for a while where we would have sailors come to help the teachers with these um, children. We will also put on events such as a fire, safety um, information play, um, we put on festivals for the children and their parents. So I really enjoyed my time working with Peeps and it was a really great opportunity for the USS Theodore Roosevelt sailors to reach back out to community and help assist. So amidst doing all this, I ended up having the opportunity to take the E5 exam early. Now this was because I had earned an EP um, and in the Navy, you get evals and evals are basically an evaluation as to what you have accomplished since you've been an E4. Um, and we get these once a year where it highlights what we have done. So you have to make sure that you've kept up with everything that you have done within that time period before the next eval. So that eval, I did receive an EP so that um, 
gave me the opportunity to take E5 early. So I ended up taking the E5 exam early. I did not make E5 um, on my advancement exam. However, I was mapped, which is maturely advanced to uh, E5. So in December 2013, I was maturely advanced to E5 and I was also named the Blue Jacket of the Year. So there was a lot going on. And my advice to those individuals who are coming onto the ship, set goals, set tangible goals. So you want to make sure that you're getting all your qualifications. You want to make sure that you're studying and preparing for your advancement exam if that's coming up. You want to make sure that you're surrounding yourself with mentors who are about two grades or higher so that they can instruct you on what the best steps are because they already been there. You know, the ship can be a flourishing environment but it sh the ship can also be a toxic environment if you surround yourself with toxic individuals so you want to make sure that you surround yourself with people who are leveling up people who are advancing people who are taking on you know more responsibility because those are the individuals who you want to be under their wing so they can guide you in the, in the right direction um i always tell people we are all given the same opportunity in the military. It's what you decide to do that makes you different from the person that's standing next to you. So just keep that in mind when you do get to the ship. It's a lot that goes on, especially when you are younger. I was about 19 when I came to the ship. Um, a lot of taking, a, not, a lot of new freedoms, more money than you're probably accustomed to. So just be cognizant of those individuals you surround yourself because that definitely can make or break your career. So moving forward, um, at this point, I am now an E5. I am over work centers um, and I have new responsibility. I have sailors I'm in charge of. Um, so I just made sure that I, I, I really took care of my sailors. I tried to mentor individuals. I became a career counselor for the air department because even though I am an IC, which is an interior communication electrician, I did not go to combat systems. Because I had a C school specifically for air department, I was in air department. So I um, picked up some collateral duties um, once I became an E5, which was career counselor. Um, I also ended up being a cable way certification. Um, so any opportunity there was to be better, I tried to take. I've always had, um, I've, I've always been motivated, but I definitely um, am very appreciative of the mentors I had on the ship. One in particular, um, who is not retired, was Chief Wright. He was always, always, always pushing me, okay, what what is next? Yeah, I remember a time where I had earned my air pin and, you know, I, I came to him so excited and he was like, okay, that's great. Where's your surface pin? And just having someone to always push you to the next level is very necessary. So he's still my mentor to this day. I call him my sea dad because he has been in my corner since I came to the USS Theodore Roosevelt as a 19 year old E3. So he's always always been pushing me and I'm very grateful for him and everyone else who has been a guidance in my life I've earned so many great mentors from the Roosevelt the list would <laughs> take me all day to name them individually so but I really thank them for molding me into the sailor that I have become today so as an E5 at this time I felt like I had completed everything I needed to complete as an E5 in the Navy. So I, I started to think about what do I need to do to get closer to becoming a doctor? Because I had always wanted to be a doctor. This wasn't something that just came to recently. I had wanted to be a doctor before joining the Navy. That's why I wanted to be a corpsman. But like I mentioned earlier, it was overmanned. So I started to go down and shadow corpsmen um, thanks to my mentor at the time who is now HMC, allowed me to come down to medical and assist. I would assist with sick call. I would shadow some of the doctors down there. I would shadow the nurse. And it's funny because the, our ship's nurse, who I was shadowing, ended up being someone who wrote my recommendation letter for both 
our MESIP program, which is um, the nursing opportunity that the Navy has, as well as EMDP2, which I ended up going through to get to where I'm at currently. So that just goes to show you never know who is going to be that person that ends up recommending you for something in the future. You never know where they're going to advance to in their career. So you always want to make a great impression. You always want to put your best foot forward when you're interacting, especially when people are taking their time out of their busy schedules to give you advice. You know, our ship's nurse at the time, she would sit down with me and go through some of the classes I would need to take um, at Old Dominion University or, you know, other schools that are potentially an option. So I'm very grateful for that time um, that she took to just give me advice and show me some of the things that I had no idea to move forward in my next step of my education. So I ended up getting back into school. I did go to Old Dominion University. Um, just to make sure you guys are tracking, I already had an associate's. I went to college at 16 and earned my associate's at 18 before joining the Navy. So I was now trying to complete a bachelor's. So when we would finish work, I would go to Old Dominion University to attend night classes in order to get closer to finishing my degree. But in 2015, I did get deployed, um, which, which was considered a world tour, but um, we ended up going to places such as Bahrain, Dubai, Singapore, um, England, and then Hawaii. So during deployment, I still try. So during deployment, I still. So during deployment, I still ended up taking classes, but I could no longer take classes at Old Dominion University. So I ended up transferring to University of Phoenix. Now, when you're deployed or when you're out to sea. There's internet, however, it's not always reliable just because we might go into River City and you may ask, what is River City? River City is when there may have been an event, a high profile or high classification event that happens that shuts down communications where we cannot communicate the information at that time or there's something, there's some type of operation issue. Um, so. I would have to, you know, explain to some of my professors why I wasn't able to turn in my work. And some of them were willing to work with me, others weren't. So there were some grades that I had to take a B on because I went to River City and I couldn't turn my homework in or I couldn't communicate to anyone to get my work turned in. So that aspect of deployment was pretty tough, but we ended up making it work. But overall, as far as the military aspect of deployment, it's great. You end up getting into a routine so it doesn't become too, I guess, you end up developing a routine. So I requested to work nights. So I would work nights during night flight ops that I would um, be over the work center. I was a work center supervisor and I would make sure that anything that was tasked at night or any records that we had to complete was done at night. And then... I would end up doing my homework at night as well while um, working. So you get into a schedule, you know, you go work out. Um, I can only speak for a carrier because I've only been on a carrier and a carrier is huge. It's almost 5,000 plus individuals on a ship. It's like a, <laughs> it's like a floating city. So there's so many opportunities to meet different people from different walks of life. Um, we had a chapel on the ship. We had multiple gyms. Um, we had two galleys. Um, so there was a lot of opportunity to do other things once you were on your off time. So I just set me a schedule. I ended up joining choir while I was on deployment. Um, you know, I would work out. I would do my schoolwork. I would hang out with my friends. I would do Zumba. <laughs> Um, so there, you know, the ship life is fun, you know, it, it has its pros and cons, but ultimately I enjoyed myself on deployment. I got to see some beautiful countries, um, and, you know, experience different cultures. And that's actually what developed my love for traveling. So after deployment, I ended up traveling a lot more just because having that taste of just a new country and a new culture, um, really enticed me. So after deployment, we were dealing with a three carrier swap with the USS George Washington and the USS Ronald Reagan. So we were initially stationed in Norfolk, but the Roosevelt ended up going to San Diego. 
the Reagan went to Japan and then the USS George Washington came to Norfolk and I was a part of the crew that took the George Washington back to Norfolk. So at this point, I only have maybe a year and some change left. So I focused on getting my um, information dominance pin before I left and just continued to mentor individuals as much as possible um, because I knew I was on my way out the door. Um, before I ended up leaving during a appointment, I spoke with the HM1. Her name was HM1 Debo. And we were just speaking on some of my career goals and aspirations. And I told her I wanted to be a doctor. And you know, this conversation, I, I'll never forget because this conversation is what opened the doors to everything that happened afterward. Um, so she mentioned Uniform Services University. And she said, hey, did you have you ever she said, hey, have you ever heard of them? And I was like, no, this is this is my first time hearing about this school. I, did, I had no idea about them. So after she mentioned that school to me, I did a plethora of research. And amongst the research that I, I did, I ended up finding out about the Enlisted to Medical Preparatory Degree Program. And I felt like this was the answer to my prayers. I felt like I can attain my dream of becoming a doctor as well as staying in the Navy because I love the Navy. I mean, that's why I've re-enlisted three times now. I feel like the Navy is the reason why I am the person I am today. Um, it's given me the tools to become a successful adult. It's given me the um, confidence to lead, the confidence to follow. Um, and overall, I owe all my success to the Navy. So of course I wanted to become a doctor in the Navy. So when I stumbled upon EMDP2, I was super ecstatic. I ended up reaching out to all the first cohort and I know they're probably like, why did, why, who's this weirdo reaching out to me? But I just want to know information. I just want to know more information. And at the time there wasn't that much out there. So I ended up reaching out and a few of them reached back out to me and explained, yes, this is a real program and these are the opportunities. And it just motivated me so much. I only had about 10 credits left at this time. So I really worked hard to try to finish my degree up. So when I ended up transferring to recruiting doing it in Arizona, I did graduate with my bachelor's in biological science. Now recruiting is a whole other beast. When you leave recruiting, when you re, when you leave recruiter school in Florida, you feel like you can save the world. You feel like you can go and enlist a homeless person and get them off the streets and, and provide them with the opportunity that was given to you. But that's just not the case. And I'm telling you this because I, I tried. I tried to do that. That's why I'm telling you guys that. So it definitely gives you a heroism complex but when you get to recruiter duty when you get to recruit duty you, you understand really quickly that that's not the case there's so many other things that go into recruiting um that you have to take into consideration so recruiting for me was definitely harder than expected i'm not a salesman <laughs> um so it did take me a while to actually become successful during recruiting, I initially started off as a medical recruiter. I ended up volunteering to assist this large station and it ended up starting off very rocky, but we ended up turning the station around and turned it and went from missing the mark to being number two station in the district. So very rewarding. Um, ultimately, when we came together and had the right crew and the, and the right leadership, um, I will say that you will come into toxic leadership and I unfortunately dealt with that in recruiting um, with some individuals who are over me. In particular, one person stated that, you know, I wasn't going to get accepted into the programs I was applying to because of where I was going to school at. And I used to have a saying, you know, speak it into existence. And I truly believe if you speak it and you write it and you visualize it into existence, it will happen. And so I had applied to EMDP2 the first time 
um and i was not accepted and this in particular individual you know found out and decided to mock me and laugh at me and recruiting is already a very stressful environment in itself just because you are in charge of your future sailors you're trying to recruit more sailors trying to think of innovative ways to you know really express all the great opportunities to high schoolers like there's so many things that come with recruiting so that was already stressful so to have someone who's supposed to be you know a beacon of guidance ridicule me and belittle me and make me feel you know worse than I already felt because I didn't get accepted to EMDP2 the first time was very toxic for me but you know ultimately everything worked out how it was supposed to work out um, and I got a better chain of command and we were able to be very successful recruiting. So during recruiting, like I told you guys, I did apply to MDP2 and I did not get accepted the first time. Um, after not getting accepted the first time, I did reach out to the program director who at the time was Dr. Green. And I reached out to the Navy uh, POC and that was uh, Master Chief Rawson. And you know, was seeking ways to improve my package um, and both of them took time out of their day to really explain to me how I can improve and I took every piece of advice they offered and I reapplied. Now I also applied to MESIP which is um, a program in I think most of the branches that allows you to still be active duty but only go to school to pursue your nursing degree. So I did apply that program as a backup plan. I was going to figure out how to reroute through that program to become a doctor. Uh, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. You always want to have a plan B. Um, so I ended up applying to both programs during the fiscal year 19. And I ended up getting accepted to both, which was mind boggling. I found out about MESIP first. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't think I was going to get accepted the first time only because it's a very competitive program. I'm not a corpsman. I really don't have a medical background. So when I was accepted the first time, I was like, oh my gosh, this is a blessing. Like I was so grateful. And then a few months later, I found out I was accepted to EMDP too. While I was stationed in Arizona, I met some great mentors, in particular, Dr. Brown. She allowed me to shadow her after I got off work. So I would go to work, do my recruiting job, and then afterward, I would go shadow her for about three to four hours. But it just re, it just reconfirmed my desire to want to become a doctor she um, is an orthopedic surgeon in phoenix arizona great great teacher great great mentor and i'm appreciative of her allowing me to shadow her and really understand what she does on a day-to-day -day basis and see her do surgeries so that was definitely a great experience So when I found out I was accepted to EMDP2, I was ecstatic. I was just overwhelmed with emotions. I cried. I called my mom. Okay, I am going to be a doctor. I am one step closer to getting there. So I ended up starting EMDP2 um, in the summer of 2019. And that was a little bit new for the program. We were the first cohort to start earlier. Most cohorts start in August, so we did start in June and it was amazing so we had orientation um you know they explained to us what is expected of us who to communicate with you know who's in charge of the academic side who's in charge of the military side what the program really offered to us and you know what our classes would be like so we had um, one class during the summer which was just to kind of you know break the ice and kind of get our feet wet um and then we went to a full schedule that first um, fall semester of 2019. So one thing I really like about the program is everyone wants you to be successful. Everyone is there to make sure that you're successful from Dr. Fox and Dr. H to all the faculty at George Mason to Dr. Green and Mr. Ruiz and everyone at USU. Everyone is fighting for your success. So if you are thinking about getting into the program or, you know, you've piqued interest since you've been following me, 
please, I encourage you, if you meet the requirements, please look into it. I will advertise and promote this program to the end because I can't say enough how appreciative I am for the opportunity um, within so for so for those who do not know I will explain what EMDP2 is so EMDP2 is the enlisted to medical preparatory degree program which is set up like a post back to allow to allow enlisted service members to come back and complete all the prerequisite sciences that they need as well as complete an NCAT and application so they can be competitive for medical school. First year you are completing the class necessary to apply to medical school as well as you take a MCAT prep provided by Kaplan and then you work on your MCAT application because you do apply to medical school the first year. The second year of EMDP2 you start taking graduate level classes which if you decide to pursue the master's in biology you definitely can um, but it's it's but it's an option so once you complete your two years as long as you have been accepted to a medical school either USUHS or a civilian school with an HPSB scholarship then you will be commissioned and then you will pursue medical school as an officer if you do decide to use HPSP, you will be on the reserve side. If you go USUHS, you will be an active duty military officer. The program is open to all branches. This is not just a Navy program. It's not just an Air Force program. Whether you're in the Navy, Army, Air Force, or Marines, you can apply. So please, I encourage you to check out the link that is in the bio to find out more information about EMDP2. And if you do have any questions that are not answered, please don't hesitate to reach out to me via Becoming Dr. Russell on IG or send me an email. So let's get into the first year and how I tackled the MCAT and the AMCLASS application. So for me, I am firm believer that the early bird gets the worm so I was working on my AMCAS application a year out before it was time to actually apply um, as well as studying for the MCAT because I was very stressed out about the MCAT I you know heard all the rumors and how you know most African Americans fail the first time they take it you know so I had a lot of anxiety when it came to the MCAT so despite knowing that EMDP2 was going to provide MCAT prep and we received all the Kaplan books for free. I sought out a tutor um, to just get started early. Um, that relationship did not work out for long so I ended up trying to find another tutor and that was going well for a while but he ended up disappearing. So I don't know what happened um, to him. So one of my classmates reached out to me and they told me about IMT, which is an integrated MCAT tutoring program, um, which was an MCAT prep. And that was the answer to my prayers. So during my spring semester, which is the hardest semester in EMDP2, just because you're taking biochemistry, you're taking physics too, you're taking biostatistics, plus all the labs while preparing your application, while in a Kaplan prep course and I added on top of that IMT so needless to say my spring semester was very busy and even after I had finished my application I took on editing others applications as well as assisting others in prepping for the MCAT as well. During my preparation for the MCAT I summoned upon other individuals who were applying in the same year as I was to medical school. That was one of the reasons why I ended up starting my YouTube because it broke my heart to see how unprepared these individuals were when knowing they were going to be applying the same time I was applying. It was about May and these individuals didn't have a um, they didn't have a personal statement complete. They didn't have their activities completed. They didn't know about some of the other examinations they would have to take um, outside of the MCAT. These individuals under my wing and helped them edit their applications, helped with preparing for the MCAT. So we would do study groups and study sessions and, you know, make sure that when it came time to 
apply, they were ready. Um, so like I said, that was one of the reasons why I ended up starting my YouTube because I thought, you know, who else is out there that is ill prepared or just doesn't have a counselor who's telling them all the other things they need to do outside the MCAT. Yes, the MCAT is important, but the MCAT is only a piece of the pie. There's so many other things that go into your application and making you a well-rounded candidate. So here comes Becoming Dr. Russell YouTube. And I tried to put as much information out there that if I was brand new to this again, what would I have wanted to know? Um, and it, it all comes down to the fact that I want to hold the hand of the individual who's trying to do the same thing I'm doing while I'm trying to figure it out. You know, that big sister, that best friend. So that's why I call you guys my besties because, you know, I've been there, I've done that, and I want to make sure your journey is easier and your journey is smoother and you don't have to go through the different ropes that I had to go through because there was a lot of things that I found out while in the process. And even though I was in EMDB2, which was great guidance and great mentorship there were still things that i had to figure out on my own so please check out those videos i do have an amcas uh, series where i discuss you know all the aspects of the amcas application how much it costs to apply and i also have my amcas application linked under those videos so you can have an idea of what the application looks like so we're getting into mcat season and I ended up having to reschedule my MCAT because this was during COVID. And originally my MCAT was supposed to be taken on May 21st, but COVID pushed that and I ended up taking my MCAT June 20th. After I took my MCAT, it was a relief not to have to study. <laughs> Every single day I did study somewhat a little bit just in case, but I went into the MCAT fully believing that I was going to pass, fully believing that I was going to get the score necessary to be successful and competitive in, for medical school and put all my cards on the table, which ended up working out well for me. Then once I finished the MCAT, I started working on my secondary applications because I wanted to be early. Remember, early bird gets the worm. So I wrote all my secondary applications, just prepped them so that way if I was, you know, fortunate enough to get um, invite back, I would have already prepared and I can send it right back to them. Just make some edits here and there and then send it. And that's what I did. I ended up sending them back and I ended up having five interviews. Did my interviews and then it was just a waiting game at that point. And then October 15th was the first day you could find out about acceptances. And I was accepted to two schools October 15th and I was just floored because all my hard work paid off. Me waking up at 5 a.m. to study, me, you know, not going anywhere, me to lean on my social media, all of that worked. And I was so grateful to know that I was there, I was accepted, I could continue pursuing to become a doctor. The gates have opened <laughs> and we can proceed forward. So we graduated from EMDP to May 2020 and then I was commissioned as well in May um, and that was just a beautiful experience to have my family and my friends and mentors, mentors I've had since I was 19 years old, come and just celebrate the success we have all accomplished in getting me here. Um, so after the commissioning, you know, I had my summer break off and then I started medical school August 2021. So I know this was a lot of information, but I did want to make sure that I put this video out here so you guys can have somewhat of an idea of what my journey was. There's so much more detail, but we would be here for days if I went into each little detail throughout my naval career. But if you have more questions or you're interested in something I said in reference to this video, please reach out to me. I am an open book. I really try to make sure that I answer everyone's questions and I'm transparent so you can understand that you can do this too. You can become a doctor. You can get into accepted into EMDP too. You can get accepted into medical school. It doesn't matter what your rate is, your job is. It doesn't 
it doesn't matter how you start it's how you finish that makes the difference so there's a few questions I would like to answer just at the end of this in case I did not cover them because my IG besties were requesting them. So the first so the first question is why did you initially choose the Navy? I chose the Navy because my mother was in the Navy. I did not go to any of the other branches to seek out any of their opportunities. Um, so that's my reasoning. Um, but is in relation to EMDP2, which will answer this next question um, about is this route specific for the Navy or can it be done in any branch? No, EMDP2 can be done for any branch. Now, I will say if you are in the Marines, yes, you can get accepted EMDP2. However, once you go to medical school, you will have to choose which branch you go into because the Marine Corps relies on the Navy for their medical needs. So that answers that question. And then as far as my, as far as how I take care of my mental health and my spiritual aspect, they go hand in hand. Um, I'm a firm believer in God and I'm a firm believer in speaking things into existence. So specifically during the time when I was studying and preparing for the MCAT and preparing my application for medical school, I would literally write down everything I wanted to accomplish and I would write it down multiple times. Um, I also did a vision board where um, I found an app where I could just put pictures of everything I wanted to accomplish within that year and I set it as my background on my phone so I could just see it as a reminder every single day. I downloaded uh, positive affirmation apps as well as I have a Bible app that sends me messages throughout the day to keep me encouraged, to keep me grounded and and just to remind me that you can do this you're strong you're smart you're intelligent um and i really just surrounded myself with only positive people during that time because i knew my peace of mind was very important at that time so i prayed i like i said i wrote out everything i wanted to manifest and speak into existence and everything I put on my vision board that year when I was applying for medical school it came it happened um, so I definitely encourage you guys to find a vision board app set it as your background or print it out and put it somewhere where you can see it or if you're a writer write down all your goals put dates next to them make sure they're tangible or something that you can actually accomplish within that time that you set um, but write your goals out you know I'm so, so, so big on speaking it into existence, writing it into existence, because it, com it comes intuition. And it happens when you do that. And then the last question was um, the interview process and how I was successful. So I do have a video um, discussing the interview process and what tips and tricks I personally recommend. And I'm recommending them because I use them. But just to answer this question here, I think you definitely want to be prepared on who is going to be interviewing you. Sometimes they send out the name and if you do a brief search, you may come across some research they did or maybe some publishings that they've had and just read the synopsis. And then at the end, when they have questions for you asking if you have any questions for them, state yes you know get into their specialty get into their publication get into their research and show that you can have that conversation with what would be a stranger um because it's not a one-way street with these you want to make sure that's conversational it's not a one-way street um keep in mind that that's a human on the other side um that's hearing your answer so you know speak upon some things that they can have a conversation with you about but if you have any more questions please do not hesitate to reach out to me um, send me an email dm me on ig that's what i'm here for best friends i really want you all to be successful in whatever you want to be and if i have any way of assisting you please reach out to me that's what i'm here for so that's all i have besties thank you for rocking with me and i hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day